I've been playing around with the GH6 for the last two days and while I've absolutely been blown away by how good this camera is and all the, you know, just sheer functionality and capabilities of this camera, is there are some quirks with this camera. Now, these aren't necessarily bad things, but they are interesting things that I have never had to deal with with a camera before. So let's get into it. So the first quirk is the monitor backlight when it's set to auto. As you can see here, as I'm putting my hand back and forth on it, it does dim and brighten significantly um, based on how much light is actually coming into the lens. There's no other, you know, light sensor. Yeah, there's the camera back sensor on the camera that sort of indicates how much ambient light is in the area. It's all on what's going in the lens. And you can obviously go into the menu and change it and have it set to a fixed number. But it's just, it's one of those ones, uh, funny things where if you're sitting there and you're imaging, especially outside, if you have like a pattern background or you're sitting in front of your computer doing it and you're pointing at light stuff, the menu constantly goes up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. It's, it can get a little annoying, but you can switch it in the menus. But yeah, it's just, it's an odd one because I would have thought there might've been like a light sensor or something like that for ambient light rather than specifically the light coming into the camera. One quirk I have with this camera is that it's actually a little bit bigger and heavier than I had initially envisioned. Yes, I saw the spec sheets and the size and the weight stuff, but there's a sort of take on once you have it in your hands, how does it feel? And overall, it's, it's a bigger camera, but I'm used to digital SLRs and even bigger cameras. So this is actually a bit smaller than what I'm used to, but um, it does have some interesting layout and stuff. So overall with my hands, which, you know, they're not the biggest hands, they're not the smallest hands, um, everything is pretty good with the exception of two buttons. Um, and that would be this button right here for checking out your uh, focus settings. Um, and also this button right here for the preview. Um, it's just, it's a little long to sort of, uh, I can do this right, let's do this way. It's a little long to reach from here where my thumb likes to be to go over this hump and it's kind of smooth, it doesn't pop out as much be able to press it on the fly and for this guy here I really feel like I'm pressing in and especially if like the monitor's out or rotate or whatnot I'm having to reach over the monitor for it where it would have been nice if the preview button was a little bit farther on the outside again it's a little bit of a quirk it's not a big issue and I'm sure after using this for a couple weeks uh, it'll be second nature it's just it's one of those things where when I first get it, I'm like oh yeah it is a bit more chunkier than I thought but it's really nice looking, everything works well. It really feels like a solid piece of construction. Um, I don't have any complaints on sort of the handling of the body so far. Although I do come from a GH4, so if you do come from another camera, you might find the top handle being a little different because usually people expect those scrolly wheels to be here and it's here. That's a Lumix thing. It's sort of the, the way they make cameras and stuff, but I do know that some people, you know, would possibly prefer a scrolly wheel here but this works pretty well and it takes about a week to figure out where it is uh, the back wheel um, is really nice I find I'm not actually hitting it when I don't want to rotate it which is nice because it's got a little bit of a, a bump here so that's good and uh, yeah overall solid construction camera just a little bit bigger and chunkier than I was expecting but I'm not upset about it I'm very happy and I have yet to hear the fan go off on anything I've done so far for testing so um, that's good in terms of overheating and we'll see how it runs as we get into the warmer summer months. So the next quirk was the CF Express B card. Now I have these Angel Bird cards and they are um, the ones that are more notorious for this than others although I've been told they're going to in the future slightly thin their uh, cards out just so that they can get in the slot but when I originally got it in here it would push in but it wouldn't sort of pop back out and it's still a little bit tight um, you have to do it about I'd say about 12 to 24 times and it evens out and you might need to grab like a little tiny screwdriver like this just to give it a little bit of a nudge up or if you have nails um, it's an odd quirk um, apparently it's because the the door manufacturer made this like tolerance really narrow and the cards are made with other tolerance on the other side anyway it's not a huge huge issue but it's one of those things to just be aware that if you plug in a card and it sticks you might have to you know nudge it up and down or something like that but it's not a big issue and i, I was able to do it without marring the card or the camera but it's just one of those interesting quirks when you plug in a stiff b card and you've never used one before and you're like is, is this supposed to happen 
My next quirk, although you might want to consider this one even a complaint a little bit, is the strap that comes with the GH6. Uh, it's a nice strap, but when you compare it to, say, the one that came with my like GH4 here, um, you can sort of see that the GH4 was a nice blue. It had that like reddish tone, similar to like how my hat is. Um, but with the GH6, it's the fabric is about the same level, but it's white on black. But when you flip it over, while the GH4 had like a nice matte finish along the whole side, this extra layer, that layer only really kicks in here for the GH6 strap. It's not the end of the world, and I think a lot of people, if you're gonna use straps, end up going out and buying your own, so they don't necessarily need to go and spend a ton of money on the strap that comes with the camera. It's just, again, it's one of those little quirks where you're like, it's, it's over $2,000 camera, I would have liked a slightly higher quality strap than, um, you know, this little stretch of sticky fabric. Um, but otherwise, yeah, it's, it, it works and it's a functional strap, so. On a similar line of stuff included with the camera is this. This is the manual, or more appropriately, this is the quick start guide. And if you want the whole manual, you actually have to go online. It's like 830 something pages. And for a camera this complicated, having that full manual is pretty much a must. Like this basically says, here's how you don't break the camera. You know, great. Um, you know, I read through it pretty straightforward, but you know, in terms of like controlling all the buttons and everything else and all that other stuff, yeah, you basically have to go online and read it or alternatively print it off. And given that 831 pages of like really high end detail, I would have liked to see that in the box or the option to buy it simply because um, if I'm out on shoots, especially the first like six months to a year that you own a camera, if you need the camera to do something interesting on a shoot, you wanna be able to refer to that manual and having that manual in PDF format might be great for the planet in terms of that aspect. It can be a bit of a pain when you're on site trying to you know, go through the many settings, etc. Although the PDF manual on the computer has it where you can click hot links to jump between sections. So it's great to have it. It's just, it would have been nice to have a little bit more than the quick start guide, especially with some of the basic stuff because my next work is the menu system. Yes, the menu system. I have yet to figure out the logic of how some of this menu system is set up. It's got some crazy stuff like here's night mode. So night mode, basically if I do it correctly here backwards, you know, turns the monitor red which is a really useful thing at night and something as an astrophotographer, I definitely want to see in the camera. However, if we go down here, and I'm doing this totally backwards, by the way, um, you can see a whole menu here for monitor adjustments. And since the night menu, you know, basically affects everything in the camera and you can do it on the monitor and the EVF, apparently it's in a different menu where I'm like, it probably should live here. And that's my sort of quirk with the menu. It's depth, it's got a lot of stuff in it, but the layout of where stuff is, and sometimes if you're wanting to do something, you have to jump into one menu to change it, come out, go to another menu item to change it, seems a little bit haphazard. Um, I would love to be able to talk to somebody sort of as their mental thinking with it, um, but it, it's a little odd. Now, saving, whoops, the saving grace to all this though, is that you do have these custom menus that I haven't set up yet. And also if you have to be shooting, you do have the quick menu. So you can set up stuff depending on what you want and stuff so you don't have to always dive into the camera. But it's one of those things where I say it's a bit of a quirk because I've never had a camera that has this much in the menu system that really needs to be customized um, for your particular shooting style. And I'm gonna be honest, it's probably gonna take me a week or two to really come out and fill out all the custom menu items, etc., cetera, uh, to be able to get it completely set up with all the different settings that I want. So for my last quirk about the camera is about uh, the codec and the RAW files that come out of this camera. Now, for RAW, there is no support yet from Adobe and Affinity Photo and I think a bunch of other companies. It's coming, but exactly when that is, I'm not sure yet. The camera's been out in the wild in the UK for a couple weeks now. It's finally dropped in Canada. So I'm hoping to see RAW support in the next couple weeks. So you're initially limited to just shooting JPEGs. It's not the end of the world but it would have been nice if that support was a little bit more timely. Uh, the other thing that I found with this camera 
and this is a, a me thing more than anything else, is that it shoots 10 bit 422 and 420, which obviously I knew the main reason I bought this camera. However, up until this point, I had only been using 8-bit and ProRes files for my recording. The idea being is 8-bit for pretty much everything, like I'm filming right now in 8-bit and everything else like that. Um, for YouTube, it works great and I don't need a lot of craziness in it. But if I needed craziness and high quality video files, I would then jump to ProRes. So currently I'm trying to learn how to use DaVinci Resolve and I have the free version. And yes, people who, who have heard this are probably rolling your eyes right now because you know the problem. The free version <laughs> does not support 10-bit uh, codexes like from the GH6 or the GH5 and stuff. You do need to get the studio version, which given that this camera pretty much exclusively currently films 10-bit footage means I can't open up all the video files. Um, oddly enough, an odd flex, the free version does handle ProRes, so I can actually film 5.7K ProRes on this camera and drop it into DaVinci Resolve. Now, this isn't the end of the world for me. I was planning on buying DaVinci Resolve Studio at some point, um, although it comes in a box, so I couldn't just click the button and say, thank you, I can now use my 10-bit files. I actually have to order it from a store and have them ship the box to me. You, you roll your eyes a bit, but okay. Um, there's a dongle option, so, you know, those are other options. Um, but what I managed to do was I actually have a program called Topaz Video Enhanced. Now, I use Topaz Video Enhanced to sort of do my noise correction, uh, fix any little blemishes in the video, etc. It works really, really well. But it also has the option of outputting uh, ProRes 422H2. So I've actually been transcoding my 10-bit files out of this into ProRes 422 10-bit, which is useful for when I want to use those high-speed frame rates, etc. Now, as I said, it's not a major issue over time. Uh, firmware updates are going to come in and add more ProRes options on the camera at 1080p and 4K. But um, for now, I've, I'm, I've got to transcode my 10-bit files until I actually get uh, the software. So that one was more on me than the camera, but it was just one of those odd little quirks you realize that when you buy something like this, there are other things you need to consider with the camera. So those are my quirks. Let me know in the comments below if there's any other quirks that you found with this camera, if you have any other workarounds. If you can make sense of the logic behind the menu and explain it, definitely tell me. And from here, I'm going to be taking the camera out and actually doing some photos and video work with it. So be sure to check out the video that's probably popped up here by now to see, you know, what I'm able to do and other cool stuff I'm going to be capturing with this camera. Until then, have a great day and thanks for watching.